everyone. Uh, welcome to the People's Food Summit. My name is Precious Piri and I'm the African Coordinator for Regeneration International. I welcome you to our segment on World Food Day. Um, I'm based in Zimbabwe and uh, I hope that you'll enjoy all the African stories that we're bringing you. Uh, so we'll have a variety of speakers uh, that will share the story of food in Africa, but our theme is really looking uh, deeply into creating hope, resiliency, and abundance uh, through regeneration. So we'll have diversity of um, offerings from people, including agroecology, permaculture, um, advocacy, and some deep and um, insightful knowledge on other aspects of food when it comes to our African continent. So today I'm also going to take um, a small opportunity to really just share broadly about some of the work that I do and uh, also that we do as Regeneration International. Um, so re first maybe let's start from what uh, we do as RI. Uh, we promote and facilitate and accelerate the global transition to regenerative food, farming and land management for the purpose of restoring climate stability, ending world hunger and rebuilding deteriorated social, ecological and economic systems. I work as a coordinator for Regeneration International, plugging into networks here on the African continent, including building partnerships of helping farmers transition towards regeneration. So I work with mostly communal farmers as well uh, on an everyday life training using the holistic management framework um, to heal cropping lands, uh, broader landscapes. Uh, and the context that I work in is people who live on the front lines of climate change, uh, and a wildlife conflict with humans, hunger, and lots of general stress because of land degradation. Uh, so let's look a bit on the story of food and the continent of Africa. So the African communities are basically in the front lines of all the impacts of climate emergency. It is now an emergency, it is a crisis, and every day we're seeing extremities of weather um, and people failing more and more to grow crops, to feed themselves, and also food shortages. And uh, But if we look at all the interventions that are coming into the African continent and the communities, especially the smallholder farmers, the current food system also falls short. Uh, the continuous malnutrition across the continent, I think we'll hear more uh, from most of our speakers who are well researched on these matters, uh, this continuous environmental degradation. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's unspeakable because every time there's water, you hear of floods, you hear of extreme droughts in one continent. Um, and in these social inequities, the poorer, poor people are getting poorer. And of course, uh, the industrial agricultural practitioners are enriching themselves at the expense of farmers. And there's neglect of all cultural values. Uh, one of our speakers actually spoke about what food and whose food. So we have to handle the narrative of the food of the African farmer. Uh, the narrative that African agriculture is backwards and that our seeds are tired is, is basically sponsored by none other than uh, the Green Revolution and all industrial agricultural advocates who want to really cause Africans to neglect what they've handled and known for so long. Uh, and some of these solutions, most of them are really not helping resolve the issues that we're going through as a continent. But today is not about uh, all gloom, uh, just giving us a bit of a context on uh, what's going on on the African continent. Okay, so uh, on a daily, I just work with communities using the holistic management framework. So I'm going to share a little bit about this. This is from the body of knowledge created by Alan Savory and the Savory Institute. And I am an accredited professional in educating holistic management for the communities using the communal curriculum. Um, so holistic management is a simple decision uh, making framework. And basically it really helps us manage 
the web of economic, social, and biological complexity, as earlier stated, as one of our sole purposes of policy, uh, of Regeneration International, that all these three must be lifted up together. So that means what, when we design work, when we work with communities or um, farming communities, we have to help communities enjoy the essence of their place. So all our project designs must express the uniqueness of our, our places. So therefore, there is no one size fits all. And, and to a certain extent, I'd love to say there are no best practices, but each place has got its own best practices that will bring the best out of the environment. And that, to me, is a regenerative framework. Um, we also have locally proven solutions as farmers. And this week will be about showcasing what efforts farmers are putting into place to really regenerate and bring back the food, the seed, and their sovereignty. Um, so there's the general good news. We have hope beneath our feet, our feet. So everything really starts with soil health. And um, when we focus so much on the health of the soil, every all the other pieces literally come together. Uh, so we work uh, to improve ecosystem processes, to strengthen the economic drivers of each uh, of the place that we work with, and then uh, to create thriving and stable communities, socially and culturally, um, and managing complexity instead of manipulating parts, uh, because these are living systems and whatever management tools we implement, they obviously tend to influence or have a reaction. And so I just spoke briefly about all our ecosystem processes, and now I won't really uh, dive deeply into them, but basically when we work on the land, we improve the solar energy flow, which is our free energy that we get uh, maximizing the photosynthesis by green plants, and we call the green plants the solar panels. Um, and then we have the water cycle, which is also maximization of all processes that are involved in the formation of rain, uh, including, you know, the ability of water to capture, uh, or ability of our soil to capture water and recharge our underground water streams. And then soil mineral cycle, which really ensures a biologically active soil. Uh, remembering that, I think, Agriculture has so much been focused on just chemistry, but I think we're bringing the story of soil biology to the fore because soil is a living body. And in uh, succession, which is community dynamics, talking about biodiversity in one given area that enables a, a, a particular ecosystem to be resilient and to be able to handle uh, issues that come with especially the changing uh, of climate. So the tools that we use really are all built on uh, mimicking natural patterns, uh, mimicking what uh, we copy from nature. And this body of knowledge really was created when Alan uh, watched how wild animals in the, in the wilderness of Africa related the grazing animals and pack hunting animals like lions and hyena. And these influence the behavior of animals. And when there was that activity and that interaction between lions and grazing animals, the land would be impacted. Animals would gather together, dung and urinate, which we call animal impact. And then at the same time, these animals will be actually grazing, which is the actual act of eating grass and browse um, off of the land. And then when these wild animals, large herds moved, these areas remained to recover in the growing season. And that's how our grasslands evolved with wildlife. And now we're using the tool of livestock and us animal and us humans <laughs> as influencers of animal behavior. Uh, so I hope that was good. Uh, it's brief, but again, you can't really explain it in brief. But basically, I think our role is to create abundance you know, from scarcity to abundance, and also bringing that excitement of the possibilities that we actually have an answer now. We know there is hope beneath our feet, and all farmers coming together, our impact can go a long way. Uh, most of the efforts are led by communities and community leaders. I work with rural communities under chiefs, and their leadership and guidance is really inspiring. And when it is strong, you tend to get 
uh, really incredible action going on. And now I'm just going to be sharing some of the benefits uh, from this work, including some stories on seed and food, uh, because we use the same tool of livestock to impact uh, soils in the crop fields and improve fertility, hence improving uh, harvest and uh, stability. So we're going to talk about first greater ecological stability, which is improved soil organic matter. And uh, most of you uh, know, and some are even better at researching this, there's increase in soil uh, carbon. So the ability of soil um, to actually capture carbon through plants um, from, the, from the atmosphere. And there's watershed management and improvement so that means underground water streams and springs uh, can actually be formed back to life and productivity on the landscape and in croplands and social stability because uh, ecological instability eventually leads to social instability. And uh, we witness that every day there's wars across the region um, based on natural resources. And then we create from uh, an abundance mentality from scarcity. Okay, so here is a picture we're showing a progressively improved whole ecosystem. This is a community that uh, we work with here in Zimbabwe. It's called uh, Community BH9 um, in local communities. Uh, you can see an improvement, especially in uh, grass and uh, abundance of forage for animals. And communities every day as I work with them, uh, we improve our knowledge on ecological literacy, uh, where communities are actual managers of their land and they know what tools will be necessary for them to actually manage and bring their land to a place where it's thriving. And so this means a lot of spending time on the ground and literally almost communicating with your ground, because only then will a farmer know what actions are needed. And then here is uh, it's a picture of uh, an improved grassland uh, compared to one that is not improved. We use the tool of holistic plant grazing. So you can imagine on the left here is a picture I had to uh, indicate using these yellow, yellow shapes <laughs> um, because the, you can, you know, the people are standing are far off. And here communities were just measuring how much forage they actually grew. And, um, you know, because now you're asking yourself in this square or, or, or whatever shape this is, can an animal be fed in one day? And this one animal unit is a cow. And so they were asking themselves, no, you need to move further and further, just showing that we didn't really grow much grass because we didn't do a good management on this portion of land. And then we have this one on the right that is showing so much forage availability, including really good quality and animals here. People say, yeah, you need about four, point, uh, four by five meters, and then you'll be able to feed one animal unit. Here on the left, we needed 17 by 18 meters to feed one animal unit. So you can tell that the carrying capacities on these uh, two different plots will be different. And this is the same portion of land but in the non-growing season. This is where the animals are actually grazing on the right now. And on the left already, you can see the soil is exposed and bare. And uh, our hope is that as people learn on the right, we all transition towards healing the broader landscape. And we have lots of participation from leaders to come and see uh, that we can actually regenerate land in dry regions to denser grass, deeper topsoil, which is what is needed for capturing all our, our water and, uh, and creating life and well-being for the community. And then, um, so I'm just going to just dive deeply to also uh, sharing how we've created spaces uh, for communities to really thrive in their relations and cropping uh, as well. So this is a circle of, uh, of unity that uh, the people on the inside are actual leaders in this community. These are government leaders, traditional leaders, and um, women leaders in the community. And they are really uh, surrounded by the villagers. This is about maybe 185 people who came together to celebrate um, soil health and uh, food. So 
we use the same tool of livestock to create abundance of soil health. And then from there, grow crops towards resiliency. So this is where now our hope comes in to say, we've seen people improve harvest by at least two times more than they would harvest naturally if they used synthetic fertilizers, which are expensive, by the way, and they get more and more expensive as uh, time progresses. And then one farmer at a time, we are changing the narrative of African food um, by showcasing, we do what we call seed fairs, where people come and showcase their seeds, share traditional ways of how to select seeds, how to preserve seeds, and, um, and also share the actual seed in itself, especially we're coming from a very hard drought, and so people had an opportunity to share uh, some seeds. Ah, oh, hey, I didn't grow this, uh, I don't have bambaranas, I don't have this traditional maize, I don't have this traditional uh, small grain or pulses. And so people would have that opportunity to share. And then some won prizes, you know, just uh, complimentary prizes from, and we partnered also with the Minister of Agriculture, especially the extension officers. They were the ones who helped us in judging and helping communities uh, also organize themselves. Everything starts from healthy soil. Um, no matter what good seed you plant, no matter how much rain comes, if the soil is not ready to grow food, and if the farmer doesn't participate in enabling the soil to capture moisture and, uh, and keep plants healthy, uh, a farmer is likely to lose, as we can see from these two pictures. Um, at the top here, the farmer intercrop, mixed crop. I know we love the word intercropping, but to me, this is mixed crop because these crops are coexisting together and they have different, role, uh, different roles, nitrogen fixing, moisture shielding, and uh, insect repelling, things like that. And um, so a farmer may lose one type of crop, but then they will win on many others because they grew varieties in a small space. And then at the bottom, you can see maize crop that is absolutely struggling <laughs> um, because one, there is no diversity. Two, the soil is not protected from the scorching sun. Three, we farm on sandy soils. It's easy, it's easy to leach and lose all nutrition uh, just from massive rainfalls. And uh, here again are pictures of just comparisons of soil. So that is impacted with um, animal uh, impact in animal manure and soil that is not. Same goes for this one. So we definitely cannot continue to do business as usual. And so this uh, regeneration and regenerative agriculture is a win-win-win, which means there is soil health, livelihood, and social uh, organizing of communities. And communities are really encouraged because when they share knowledge and celebrate, and they have a broader, healthier landscape. For me, these two cannot be separated. It is World Food Day, but I also feel like the broader landscape cannot be left out because that's where most of our life really depends on. And this is the land of our ancestors, the land of our forefathers, and we are stewards of this land. And we therefore carry this flag and with pride to bring back uh, the sanity in, in land management, the sanity in agriculture, and the sanity in food systems. So to you all, happy World Food Day, and may you all be well nourished and be well fed to regeneration. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our keynote segment for the People's Food Summit. We are here with the awesome Bridget Mugambe, who is from the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. She's the, she's the programs coordinator at AFSA and uh, she's based in Uganda. She, uh, Bridget is actually an advocate who is currently based in Uganda and she's worked in this industry of bringing food sovereignty and seed sovereignty to communities for a long time. And uh, one of her passions is agroecology. And she also has worked on several campaigns for farmers, communities, 
citizens' rights uh, to see land, food, and fair trade, as well as improved livelihoods. Um, as part of AFSA, she also coordinates uh, the organizations that work on agroecology for climate action. So basically also this year she's been really instrumental in mobilizing messaging that I'm sure all of you, our partners, read on the communique that we are taking as AFSA to the climate conference in Egypt, uh, COP27. Bridget, thank you so much for making your time. I know it's a very busy season for you, um, but you are welcome to this platform to share with people the story of seed and food on the African continent, and we appreciate you. Over to you now. Um, thank you so much, Precious, and I uh, wish everyone a happy World Food Day. Uh, my prayer is for everyone to get uh, a plate of food today, um, to, to go to a bit of the stream, to get a plate of food of their preference, it is uh, always my prayer. It is what uh, gets me out of bed to ensure that um, food is equally distributed, that everyone eats to their satisfaction, not just um, the satisfaction of their body, but also their mind and their spirit and their soul, because food is supposed to contribute to all those aspects of our lives. Um, again, thank you, Precious, for introducing me. My name is Bridget Mugambe. And I've already been introduced by Precious. So I'll just go through um, my presentation. Um, what I will speak about today, uh, first I'll briefly introduce um, the organization I work with, which is the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Uh, then I'll, I'll speak a bit about the context of the current food system that we are in. And then uh, speak uh, to uh, some of the proposed strategies, how do we uh, transform our food systems, and also uh, conclude uh, with a call of uh, key actions that, that we can take. Uh, to go straight into uh, what AFSA is, uh, AFSA is an alliance, like the name says it. We are a continental alliance. Our core business is uh, food sovereignty advocacy, and in that we look at self-sufficiency, uh, local ownership, and environmental stewardship uh, within Africa. Uh, we do our own analysis, and that is uh, built on the fact that um, years, uh, I could say maybe decades or two or three decades ago, um, we had less uh, of African research, most of our analysis, uh, was based on um, what we got from our brothers from the north. And uh, so we felt there is a need to do our own analysis and share information based on what we have uh, researched and analyzed ourselves. The other focus for us was supposed to create a one a loud voice for Africa. AFSA brings together um, uh, different networks working on issues of food sovereignty that include land, seed, uh, climate change, and mobilizing citizens to create one loud voice at the regional level and um, of course at the global level. Um, so that is a bit about AFSA. This is about the membership. It is as diverse as, as you sit there. So to go into the context a bit, uh, what uh, we are all seeing right now. One, of course, we, we all know about the, the looming food crisis. The increasing cases of hunger malnutrition, the statistics are not good uh, from the UN bodies, from World Food Program, from FAO. We see um, there are increases, increasing cases of, uh, of hunger in regions like um, Eastern Africa, in countries like Kenya, parts of Uganda, Somalia, Ethiopia. We see over 30 million people predicted to get into uh, severe cases of the food crisis by the World Food Program. Of course, there's a rising cost of food items. Uh, there's a high cost of fertilizer. Also tied into that are the insecurity and political instabilities within Africa. But we've also seen the impact of the Russia-Ukrainian war, uh, where farmers can no longer access the fertilizer that has been always promoted and introduced to them. So we are seeing a high cost of fertilizers and other inputs that farmers cannot uh, access right now. Of course, issues of insecurity and political instability are very uh, key in determining access to food, 
um, then also the threat of the climate emergency, which is no longer debatable. Um, the other, other context that, that I've also just mentioned about is the climate emergency, that uh, we know Africa is uh, inevitably um, coming out as the biggest victim, as the largest victim of uh, the climate emergency. We are seeing prolonged dry spells and droughts affecting um, both crop farmers, pastoralists, and fishers, uh, increasing loss of biodiversity that has also been documented by the IPCC, and the dominance of false climate solutions. False climate solutions, which speak to um, greening, for example, uh, areas that were formerly for crop production that were known forests, both solutions that talk about uh, carbon trading and, you know, uh, in a way creating space for industries to produce, to, pro to continue polluting while claiming uh, to be um, mitigating climate change. Four solutions that talk to replacing indigenous forests with uh, monoculture plantations, with uh, foreign tree species that are not used to certain environments that are actually in ways also affecting uh, the soils. Uh, four solutions that are advancing production over food sovereignty. Four solutions that are just speaking to um, you know, production of a few of a few staples and not speaking to diversity and production at whatever cost, meaning use of synthetic uh, inputs that are ultimately killing the soils. We see a lot of false solutions in the name of technologies, including genetically modified organisms. So these, uh, in our opinion, in are uh, worsening the climate emergency. Then, of course, the limited climate funding. Climate funding that is um, one, even the available funding is not uh, funding the appropriate uh, solutions, but then it is still limited, especially in the African context where um, most African, where Africa is facing uh, the hugest impact of climate change. So the other um, context that I can speak about is the increasing corporate control food systems. We are seeing a deliberate change in seed and plant protection laws opening up for gem oils, for hybrid seeds, restricting farmers' uh, access to seed systems. And this is a process that has gone on over 20 years in Africa, deliberately um, changing uh, African uh, seed laws and plant protection laws to lock out farmers who cannot um, maintain the standards that are, are promoted by these uh, seed laws. Um, then the growing role of supermarkets in food processing, sale, and distribution. When we realize that, um, of course, uh, as countries uh, develop, as countries change, there are lots of other developments that come in place. Supermarket is one of those. Uh, the challenge we see with the supermarkets is that they have uh, taken space for food retailers, for uh, territorial markets, so every small food can be put in supermarkets. Supermarkets are prioritizing, the large supermarkets, they're prioritizing food imports um, over a local uh, purchase of local food. So we are witnessing um, cases where, you know, supermarkets are importing chicken, importing fruits, you know, from, from um, from outside uh, the countries where they are located. This is all um, increasing the corporate control food systems. Of course, the, load of, the loss of land by communities is tied in there. And the trade laws, the investment laws in many African countries are less favorable to local food producers. They are more import-oriented and less export-oriented, which means they are promoting more import of local of, um, uh, foods from other countries and less uh, promotion to territorial markets. Then uh, lastly, and tied into uh, the corporate control is the food narratives. What Africa is seeing right now is, um, is an increasing uh, change in the food narratives. In the media, uh, when you talk about healthy food, it is packaged in a certain way, it is uh, labeled in a certain way, 
So this, uh, in a way, is changing the narrative around local foods. Market foods are termed as unhygienic. Uh, street food is termed as unhygienic. Uh, you know, so that whole narrative is changing around uh, around what is uh, what is uh, hygienic food, what is healthy food, what is uh, nutritious food. The entire um, narrative around easing nutrition by you know packaging foods as as medicines, as tablets is really, really um, changing how our food systems are uh, deliberately being designed. And then, of course, the efforts to dilute some of the concepts like agroecology and food sovereignty that are very key for Africa. Agroecology is, um, is, is not a new concept. It, is, uh, it has been you know, around for millennia. And what, when we speak of agroecology, we speak of uh, not just the food production, but also the people that are involved, also the citizens that consume the food, also the science. So the deliberate effort to, to dilute some of these concept, uh, concepts, of course, also, in a way, undermines uh, what they stand for. So in terms of the context, that's what I can share. And uh, to look at how do we build hope, resilience, and abundance uh, in changing our food systems. One, uh, there's a need to promote agroecological entrepreneurship and territorial markets. Uh, for a number of reasons, territorial markets, um, AFSA undertook a research in 19 African countries uh, last year on um, agroecological entrepreneurship and territorial markets to understand how they operate, are the challenges they are in and how we can uh, further enhance that recognition and promotion. Um, one uh, aspect we realize is that territorial markets are more inclusive. They are more inclusive in terms of gender, in terms of uh, income gaps, in terms of literacy levels. However, they are challenged because they are not uh, adequately supported in terms of finance, in terms of organization, and a number of other Places. However, they are also a source of, um, of access to, to food for so many people, to cheap food, to nutritious food. So if they are not promoted, if they are replaced by supermarkets, then we are at a risk of in, uh, increasing um, uh, food insecurity and uh, malnutrition. Because we all know that the narrative around supermarkets is that it's for middle income or uh, high income, whatever they are called, you know, class of people. So the need to promote territorial markets speaks to the majority of um, of African people that can easily access these markets. Um, then uh, the, the, the need to integrate agroecology into climate actions. Um, this is also a campaign that AFSA has, has um, been uh, spearheading since 2019. And the issue here is that Climate actions are promoting false solutions. Most climate actions, like I, I talked about earlier, on, are promoting false solutions. Agroecology is a viable solution, we believe, because one, it looks at the practices that involve the people themselves, the local knowledge, but also integrates it with, with, um, with science. Then also it looks at issues of food security, it looks at issues of local markets, However, this is neglected within uh, climate policies and and um, and negotiations. So there is a need for deliberately integrating agroecology into climate policy because we know uh, when an approach or when um, an agenda is not part of the negotiations or the policies, then it completely loses financing. It is not promoted, and governments will not give it the due uh, recognition. Uh, then. Um, the third uh, strategy is to promote healthy soils for healthy foods. We see a lot of our soils are getting degraded. Uh, one reason is, of course, they have been overly used. The other reason is that we are using the wrong inputs. There is more a promotion of synthetic uh, inputs, which we know are bad for the soil, which you know have killed the soils, which are killing microorganisms. So we are promoting for healthy soils and uh, healthy foods. Healthy soils by use of uh, biofertilizers, biopesticides, and other bioinputs. And AFSA is, is uh, spearheading a program on, um, in 15 African countries working with soil centers 
to be able to um, uh, work with farmers, extension workers, and other actors to um, rejuvenate our soils, to uh, promote practices that rejuvenate our soils that are affordable for farmers, but also increase the production. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yes, so yeah, the other strategies around promoting pharmacy systems, which is self-explanatory, uh, pharmacy systems have been proven one to feed us, uh, to, to provide the diversity uh, in terms of, of the food we eat, they also accessible small-scale farmers, but there are also issues attached to it beyond uh, uh, food quantities and diversity, but also culture issues that are attached to farmer managed systems. Um, yes, uh, we need to mobilize citizen voices for sustainable food systems. Without the citizen demand, then uh, we will not. Um, we can have it in policies. We can have it uh, everywhere. But if the citizens do not demand uh, for sustainable food systems, for sustainable practices, then we will not uh, be able to attain uh, our ultimate goal of Africa feeding itself. Issues of empowering community voices for land rights are very critical because we know land is very central to Africa. It is central to food production. The misconceptions around land, um, the fact that Africa has a lot of, uh, you know, of unused land that is open for taking for investors, that misconception and failure to understand that land is also left for following, land is left for rotation, land is left for hunting, for cultural practices, for ceremonies. That failure to understand the community engagement around land, the community attachments that, that come with land, the social issues that come with land, it also needs to be um, it needs to be brought to the fore. Communities have to be empowered to be able to raise these voices. We recognize that um, some of the regional strategies, like the, the African Union land governance strategy, has recognized community rights. But we need citizens uh, to come out and, and uh, raise these voices so that community rights are not prioritized. I mean, so that investor rights and large uh, land-based investments are not prioritized over community ownership and use of land. Um, yes, I'll conclude with uh, my poll. Uh, my poll one is uh, for us to support a transformation of Africa's food systems through recognition and integration of local and indigenous knowledge in climate and food uh, production, to build capacities of food producers towards um, sustainable agricultural approaches, to document and share evidence that agroecological food systems work. It is one of the uh, key challenges that we have right now because it is practiced for, for us, it is inbuilt for us. Many practices are not documented and shared. For example, in terms of climate action, some of these practices are not documented and shared. So the feeling is that they are not working, even when uh, they are clearly working on the ground. We need to engage with climate and food policies to integrate and finance agroecological approaches. And uh, of course, build a movement that will demand for sustainable food systems. It is very critical that we have a, a big voice or a loud voice, a large voice from Africa that is demanding for sustainable food systems. Thank you so much. I would like to um, close it off there for now. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Bridget. That was so beautifully and generously shared. Um, you began with the, with the statement that really gave me shivers and um, goosebumps. <laughs> you said, be fed with the food you love. Yeah. Not only be fed or nourished only in your body, but in your soul and also your spirit. Um, you know, and, I mean, on the surface, that just looks like a beautifully crafted statement. But uh, I think to every human, whether African or not, we are totally tied to our food in that depth. Um, so tell me why is this important to view our food, both body, spirit, and soul? Mm. 
Yes, um, I think one, one, uh, what is happening today with our food is um, when we talk about food, the first um, thing that comes to mind or the first discussion is where is the food and uh, how much is the food. But when you look at um, many of our culture setups, and we have to accept Africa and many other places, even outside Africa, as human beings are cultural. That is why we stay in communities and don't want to move. That's why we call places our ancestral places. And one of the critical aspects that defined us as people is the food that we eat. That is why when you move to a country or to another community, the first question you ask is, what food do you eat? How do I prepare this food? And I'll give you an example uh, from my from my um, region. I come from the central region of Uganda. We have a staple which is matoke, but in all that we have different varieties of matoke for different functions, for weddings, you know, for marriage we have a variety we prepare, for funerals we have a variety we prepare, uh, for birth of a child. We have a variety that prepare, we prepare and in a certain way, you know, for the new mother. So all these cultural attachments keep people together as one people. They keep harmony, they create harmony. They give you that satisfaction as a human being. They give you that sense of belonging, that sense of purpose. And it is why we live as human beings, not to just walk and move and breathe, but to have that inner satisfaction also as people. So food has a lot of identity attached to it. It has a lot of harmony it creates. It brings people together as communities. And we need to recognize that there is food that is eaten communally. There is, you know, there are meals that are eaten communally. So all that in a way creates harmony and builds, you know, you as a person, it gives you satisfaction as a human being. And that um, inner, you know, feeling that I probably cannot explain very well. So it's critical to look at food beyond uh, beyond, uh, beyond just that. You know, I'll give, just give you another small example. In, in my region still, you know, corn, corn used to be a food for poor people. So if someone came to your house and found you, um, with you know eating corn even now they would feel like oh, okay i think they're not doing well financially you know? but now it is it is the food that is being advanced everywhere and i'm not saying it's bad food but i'm just saying there is a lot that we put we try to cook here yeah. yeah. wow this is so beautiful and uh, such a beautiful example um and if you look at Generally, in our language, most of our proverbs are also centered around food, around generosity, mm. around being able to give a visitor your food. <laughs> mm. um, it, it, it's so engraved in us. That's so beautiful. And um, I think to conclude our talk today, uh, mm. you know, when you say that agroecology is being undermined, you find that it's being undermined and packaged into just a small group of ambitious people who think they will nourish themselves with little gardens. But then I think mm -hmm. we, are, we are pushing out that narrative because agroecology is a whole framework. Um, yeah. And what I picked from your presentation today is actually that it is, first of all, there are practices or tools in the agroecology framework, but mm -hmm. it is also a social movement so movement building, we want every people everywhere from the consumer to the farmer, the farmer to the consumer and in between to be engaged. Agroecology also pushes forward the importance of our voice in the marketplace. Um, first, local market, next, national, regional and international. We can possibly hold those spaces together and that it is a science. Um, I think this narrative must really be pushed forward. And uh, I don't know what else did I miss, but like uh, for you, uh, what would be the urgent message to the world uh, in terms of what everyone can do to plug into all the aspects of agroecology? What can each one of us do? Just one strong sentence as a closing. 
Yeah, well, it is, it, it's difficult to, <laughs> I'm thinking of what could be the one sentence, because I want to say so many things. Oh, you, you are the lady who writes communists, like two pages. It's all right, give it away then. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, when you are speaking, I was, um, of course, I was nodding my head and agreeing with you because, you know, what one of the, the biggest challenges that agroecologists face is, apart from um, the low financing, um, is the misconception that um, advocates for agroecology are advocating for poverty and for backward practices, you know? It is such a big narrative. It is such a huge narrative that it spreads to the markets, you know, uh, to the consumers, that this is production that is backward, which is not true at all. And the misconception that agroecology has to be on a small scale. It cannot be, um, you know, scaled up. The reason that agroecology has been tied to a small scale is because it does not have the adequate financing, because land is not allocated for agroecological practices, so there are all these challenges that are keeping agroecology the way it is. But despite of all that, we need to recognize that farmers are actually feeding us through agroecological practices. That is a fact that is happening. So what we need to do as, um, as, as citizens of Africa, as global citizens, one, we need to demystify. We need to demystify um, the perceptions around agroecology, which which um, which are, is putting it side by side with with the with poverty, with dirty farmers, you know, which uh, which should not be uh, should not be the case. Most importantly, as global citizens, what we need to do is to demand to demand for the right food, because when you demand for the right food then you'll support the people that produce that food. All of us want to eat healthy food, not just what we can access. The reason some people eat unhealthy food is because they cannot access the right food. It is not distributed through markets. And a few that will access it, it will be maybe very expensive because of the cost of getting it there. So as we increase our demand to our government, because governments serve the people, they are meant to represent the people. If as global citizens we stand up and demand for agroecologically produced foods for support to territorial markets, then we'll see agroecology um, advancing for financing to agroecology. Then we'll see agroecology advancing and uh, ultimately feeding us even much more than it already is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, thank you for your time and this bonus chat at the end of your talk. We really appreciate, again, Bridget Mugambe for giving us the keynote uh, speaking for this year's World Food Day. Uh, happy World Food Day to all of you. And again, in the words of Bridget, may you be fed, nourished with your favorite meal, body, soul, and spirit. Thank you again. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Prisha. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Elias Mube, whom we passionately call as Bashoko, or affectionately call him as Bashoko. And uh, he's here to present on holistic management, uh, which is something that he's worked on in, uh, from 1999. Elias is working at the Africa Center for Holistic Management, which is Severit Institute's first hub. It is based here in Zimbabwe. Um, and Elias has a vast experience with uh, working with communities, working with small and large NGOs, training other trainers, as well as doing coaching and follow-up support. Today, he's bringing all that wealth of knowledge into this space to share with us the true hope that we have in following the holistic management uh, framework to heal landscapes as well as our food system. Uh, Bashoko, you are welcome. Uh, we also jokingly call Elias Mr. Holistic because he's one of <laughs> our long standing mentors in this uh, subject of holistic management. Bashoko, you are welcome and please check us out. Thank you. Hello, everyone. 
the need for food security. Food security requires many contributors from diverse environments, not just a few dominating organizations. It should include animals, crops, fruits, vegetables, and many more. Small-scale farmers should contribute more due to their numbers. What is required is know-how, and the holistic management contributes to that. Holistic management addresses these challenges. Bare land, as we can see in the picture on the far left top, with a lot of bare land, but big trees, which means it's a management problem that can be corrected. And below that picture, you have overrested grass that no animal will eat, and people usually use fire, which contributes other problems. That can also be corrected. And we look at our rivers, they are full of the sand instead of water. And the crops are failing in most communities. That is a, a, a disaster in waiting. But communities can actually do corrective measures on that. What is holistic management? It is a framework for making sound decisions socially economically and environmentally. There should be no casualties when producing food. All members of society should gain, the economy should improve, the environment should not be damaged as is the case now when we have pollution, erosion, and the extinction of plant and animal species due to the technologies that we are using. Our program goal is to empower communities to improve their lives, the life of future generations by restoring land and natural water sources. So we want to see grass growing to the edge of the water and we want to see clean water in our rivers. But to do that, each community must create its own holistic context, which states quality of life they want, not just any kind of life. It should be a written description of of how a specific community wants its life to be based on what they value most. And on the future resource base, the behaviors that will ensure that that life is attained and sustained. And how the land has to be like to sustain the quality of life forever. We don't want food today and, to, and water tomorrow. We want it today and tomorrow and forever. So once that policy context has been written, then the community can check all its actions against that context. If there is a problem they should, and they want to take action, then should ask themselves, does this action address the root cause of the problem? If it's not, then they should look for a, a, a different solution. Then the next question, the question is, does this action enhance or harm our relationship? Because relationship yeah, um, harmony among people and communities is important for progress to be made. Does this action enhance or harm our land, water, and other natural resources? Because if any action harms our land or water or natural resources in the long run, we'll pay the penalty. Nature will penalize us. Does this action enhance or harm our livelihoods? So the way we are making our life, uh, you know, does this action really take us to improve the livelihoods? The environment that sustains us is driven by four ecosystem processes. The water cycle, mineral cycle, community dynamics, and energy flow. The water cycle it can either be effective or ineffective. If the land is covered, the soil is porous, rainwater soaks into the soil. And the water that will flow from that land will be clean. If it's ineffective, you see it by kept soils, bare land, and the water that just runs off, and the water in the rivers will be muddy. 
So those the community should be looking at that. You know that when we are working with communities, some are illiterate, so the written word may be difficult for them. So we produce pictures to help them. Like the picture on the left, which shows uh, covered land. When uh, rain uh, falls, then it soaks into the soil. Whereas on the other hand, we have runoff and very little water soaks into the soil. Once it has rained, we need to retain that water. So if, uh, if the soil is covered, when the sun shines and the wind blows, the water will be retained in the soil. But if it's bare, most of the water will evaporate. So it's important to have covered land. Bare land is enemy number one, but many people are not aware of that. Mineral cycle can be effective. There is the decay, you have robbed your soil life, and the plants that grow be healthy, and so will the, the animals. You find that animals will be having a shiny coat. It's ineffective if you see leaves or, of, of trees or plant, uh, plants or dung just drying and kept, uh, turning gray, then just being bent by the elements. And there will be little soil life and the plants that will grow there and the animals will be unhealthy. Community dynamics. Environment is a living community. So biodiversity is important, species and genetic diversity. The balanced age structure of young ones, medium size, and large ones, or mature ones. So the biological community will be complex and stable. But if you have single species outbreaks, like weeds, armyworm, locusts, rats, that environment is a, a, a challenge. The young, most of the young are absent or dying, the biological community is simple and, and unstable. That's why we have these fluctuations. Solar energy flow. When the land is covered with plants, especially with broad-leaved plants, they will, it will, the solar energy, it, they will capture a lot of solar energy. And if plants density is close by, close plant spacing, then you capture more energy. But if you have bare land, narrow believed plants that capture little energy and wide plant spacing, very little solar energy will be captured. Instead, it just simply tends to heat. So the planning of part of it and what is planned grazing and herding, we use multi-species head of livestock. Communities should create their own land map and they create their own grazing plan and we head livestock usually during the growing season and also the non-growing season, which we call the dry season in our um, other environments that have seasonal rainfall. As we can see in the pictures there, we have goats, cattle, and all are foraging together. Once we do that, allergical activity increases with animal impact. So animal impact is any effect the animals do, either trampling, dunging, urinating, and that produces a, a, a positive effect on the land, like these dung beetles that will now start working on the, the manure and bury it into the soil where it is required by plants. That's nature helping us in, um, in our management. Uh, sites on our, 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 on our land, which was, was bare for quite a, now, a long time, and we put a movable livestock pen or crawl, in, as we call it in Southern Africa, and when it rains, a lot of annual grasses grew. And by the end of the following year, we had our soil covered. Soil cover is important for our landscape. In another community that we're working in, um, when we started in 2004, we had Bearland, which was 40%, by 2007, which was about 
Two years later, the bare land had been reduced to 8%. So communities can actually do it. And our river used to dry around March at the end of the rain season. Now it flows in the dry season. So land restoration at Mangombe, as we can see now, we have lush vegeta vegetation and healthy grass. That's what our landscape should be. But it emanates from the description we have said above. If you look at the livestock, healthy animals in a movable crow with shine coats, and thus the same animals in the rangelands. In problems, we can use that movable pen for the livestock to improve cropland soil. When you plant, your crops will be health and the harvest will be good, as it shows in the picture here. And now the family is no longer worried about the food security because they've now secured their own food on their own land using their own resources. Here is another community. Uh, the, the woman used a movable crow on the far left. The, the, she didn't use the uh, livestock. She was using goats. And when she planted, you can see the difference. Animal impacted, the maize is taller than her, and the pumpkins between the maize is getting into the sun, sunlight, whereas on the control there, the maize is still knee height. So livestock can be used to improve cropland soils as well as rangelands. And then the comparisons of yields from animal impacted croplands. We usually ask communities to pick the biggest crop, the medium one, and the smallest. As you can see from the picture above, the smallest the, in, is almost the same size as the biggest on the control plant. So that's what food security in, in means to the communities. So what are our training courses? Make them very simple. We have two days field seminar for organization leaders for them to understand how holistic management um, can benefit their organizations. Then for improving cropland soils, we have a two-day course. Then for plant grazing, we have three days holistic plant grazing course. And then five days for heading for headers. Here we include low stress animal handling. Then the 12 day community facilitator training program is for training the trainers, people training other communities. So those are the, my contact uh, details. Um, uh, and I will say goodbye by this gentleman. This inspector, land inspector with a, a red cap, a, a yellow cap, black jacket, who helps us to control any parasites on the range lines. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elias Bashoko. That was so beautiful. Um, yeah. I'm actually thinking just before you go, um, yeah. Maybe in your career, I know it's you've been in this for many years, uh, in, in land regeneration for quite a while. What has been yeah. some of your very important uh, insights in terms of how, to, how important is it for us to break down information to meet communities where they are? Yeah, when we started, we used to train people on holistic management. They were not really getting it fully until we realized that, no, this textbook is very difficult for an ordinary person. So we had to break it into small pieces like land monitoring, one small piece, land planning, another small piece, holistic plant grazing, another small piece, and heading, another small piece, and head management. Once you do that, people just get it and they don't confuse points. And 
once they understand it, communities can just simply do it. They will just produce the results that are required. So it's important to break down to the level of the simplest level possible. That's awesome. And sometimes it's the simplest level and also to a level that resonates with the community. Um, yes. For example, in our rural communities, yeah, you can talk about climate change. Maybe people will understand, but they won't understand the emergency. <laughs> then when you talk exactly. about, guys, we can improve the yield of our crops and forage for our animals, because that's what we relate with. And then we have many side benefits of then healing the climate. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because when you go to communities that have a problem, a challenge, they'll say, we want water. We want a forage. But climate change is a little bit distant. But once they start doing activities that improve the water and the food, then they are also addressing the climate change. Nice. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much, Elias, for sharing on managing complexity using holistic management. When you were talking all along, I was sensing a blend between social, economic, and ecological relations of being land managers. So thank you so much, and we look forward to sharing your story and video with the world. Thank you, Ashoko. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Growing up, bambara nuts or nyimo as they are affectionately known are one of those things we used to eat as a dessert or to snack on when we came from school. But I never really thought, where do these come from? How are they grown and how are they cultivated? So today, in my quest to find out a little bit more about nyimo, we are here in Gormonzi at Mai Chiangwa's home to find out how they are grown, how they are preserved, and most importantly for me, how they are cooked and eaten. So join me as I find out a little bit more about what makes nyimo what it is to Zimbabwean culture. Okay. 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 Mm. <laughs> Kupera kwa November, mm. andi tii. Tata kuto pinda December. Saka tuko tii su January tii tata kuwe nika February, March, April. Okay. Tako tuto tii. Tako tuto kuwe. Saka tuto adi period tii three months. Three months. Sato Eve. Sato Eve, but it's not a good thing. So now I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to
Azitore nko ya karebu. Twenty to thirty minutes is okay. Kana one one is akafu fanira. Kana zai bonu zone ne kutse nko kwa zai zai tafu leo. Oh, kutse muga waka kufuri kaga. All right. Ndo na zaka si ana zai zai wa id zai zai ne zimu id zimu ni aso one kera. Zini ni oroku dai. Dishida kujiga ne sasa. Dishida kujiga ne rice. Dabika dadu kwa tisa saib. Ndo tu ndo bisha makanda ndo zimeni. Ziri nyoro kudai zine makoko disi na chakuu nusu tini makusten dunto ina kumanda dunto chera ni mazungu dunto hisa ba moto dunto bika ziba dunto na wani tisha dunto na wani dunto dunto zaidi na zaidi dunto na wani tisha kana ni drink wa bauchi kuruzi kwa na zawa mezo asio zawa amko nuko zaga na saza or something like that zikanga zawa mezo kwa saza risu ni tumbuda asi porridge porridge tuno kwa sawa gazira porridge kama koko kwa kana mata tajika zawa mata asio zita mengi Ani zamu zama shanda sisi, zama mbota la zogita compost manua, ano zoshanda hiriga na zama. Isu ma kupani matunda cha tunuras, ma koko manua rewa ya, pata nua jiga, tunua kuna watora, tuwa omesa, tuwa jira mduri, kwa pata nua ndakuno gesi makresh, tuwa kuna sangalis, tuto gesi sira ukuzi. Oh, saga ni. Ibi na sina kubi kwa cha tuno pata nua sokora fiti nim, ajira sifuz, tuno songo watora, ano jua. Oita pau de quatro e cinco anos não é mais chibagé, tu ainda tu chega aí, tá a gente daí, mas cresce de um pau. Ah, alright, alright. I came here really excited to learn more about Nimo, and with what I've learned, I'm really inspired as a chef to go back in the kitchen and experiment and try it out on new dishes. But for the meantime, I did a little salad or a little spin on a salad, with some tomato, some cucumber, some onion, which are all readily available, even in the rural setting, rural gardens. I feel that we really underappreciate this as an ingredient and we don't talk enough about it. So I feel that we should go out there, cook more, experiment more. So check it out on the next episode as we discover more about our food, culture and traditional practice. for this opportunity to be among speakers on this important day. Um, my presentation will showcase the journey of African civil society, including that of the African Center for Biodiversity in the struggles for seed sovereignty, depicting especially mobilization against draconian commercial seed and plant variety protection laws based on Newport 1991, which dispossesses farmers of the right to their seed and criminalizes farmer seed and their age-old practices. Now, I would like to start by briefly, giving a, um, by briefly giving a context on the onslaught of the Green Revolution on the continent, as this is the agenda in which commercial seed laws and those aligned with the UPOP 91 are situated in. Now, over the last decade, two decades, Multiple strategies have been at play to usher in the industrialization of agriculture on the African continent, spearheaded by the new Green Revolution. Now we have seen how the Green Revolution has been rolled out through infrastructure development in key regional hubs to transport commercial grain and oil seed in growth corridors at historically important transport routes. Secondly, We've seen changes in legislation related to land and seed. And in particular in Africa, we've, we've witnessed changes in national seed and plant variety protection legislation to enable private ownership of seed and other natural resources with, with current public participation and oversight. And thirdly, technical and practical support work has been done with farmers to facilitate the dissemination of technological packages comprising of commercial, corporate, mainly hybrid seed, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, irrigation and land consolidation, access to interest-based credit and commercial markets. Now, this has also been coupled with skills development supported by universities 
and the Agricultural Research Institute institutions. Now, the adoption of African government of the Green Revolution in regional and national agricultural policies have provided the impetus for the privatization and corporatization of African agriculture driven by AGRA, which was established in 2006, among other players of similar orientation. The CADAP also, the CADAP known as the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program largely defines Africa's agricultural agenda at the continental level. And this has also provided the enabling framework for the Green Revolution Project. Now we've also seen recent blueprint adopted at the AU, such as the AU's common position on food systems, which stemmed from the United Nations Food Systems Summit, a corporate captured space, and others like the AU Green Recovery Plan. And these blueprints continue to entrench the industrial and green revolution model in Africa with the push for corporate seed, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, genetic engineering, digitalization and financialization of smallholder farmers. Now, AGRA continues to play a key role in the development and scaling up of commercial seed systems of the continent. And this is through uh, capturing policy making uh, processes related to seed and agriculture. For example, its program for Africa's seed system has established agro dealers across the continent that act as conduits for the distribution of corporate seed and, and synthetic fertilizer which in turn results into the heavy reliance on corporate seed also facilitated through farm input subsidy programs in Africa. These farm input subsidy programs have had no real impact on the quality of life or incomes of farming households in Africa. And the main beneficiaries are the multinational corporations who amass profit from a guaranteed market for seed and fertilizer. Thus, corporate solutions further continue to exacerbate inequalities, indebtedness, and marginalization of smallholder farmers and the rural and the urban poor in Africa, while at the same time, causing more harm than good to African ecosystems and agricultural biodiversity. This adoption of a linear model of development linked to industrialization and modernizing Africa, and in particular African agriculture, led by Agra and others, is deeply concerning. ACB and African civil society organizations have exposed the problem associated with the push for this green revolution in Africa for the past two decades. It is worth noting that a research released in 2021 confirmed ACB's forewarning that in several countries, including Kenya, Mali, Zambia, and Tanzania, the Green Revolution has not only failed to deliver on its, on its promises, but has hugely exacerbated hunger by 30%. Now, this capitalist capture of agriculture has led government to put in place systems uh, such as policies and laws, as earlier mentioned, crafting draconian commercial seed legislation to promote private sector involvement in the seed industry. Now, examples of such stringent regulations include the Kenyan Seed Plant and Varieties Act of 2012, the Tanzanian Seed Act of 2013. Uh, recently, we also have seen the draft Zanzibar Act of 2020, among others, which restrict the sale and exchange of seed that is not certified. And this has huge implications for pharma, pharma seed systems, farmers' autonomy, and African smallholder farmers. Now, we have witnessed also regional harmonization of seed law frameworks crafted under the IEGs of regional blocks and communities such as the Southern African Development Community, SADAC, the Common Market for East and Southern Africa, COMESA, and the Economic Community of West African States. 
this has have also gone ahead to plan to uh, to craft plant variety protection legislation based on the highly restrictive UPOV 1991. Now, regional harmonization aims to expedite trade in seeds across national borders and expand corporate markets in, in the region. These laws not only serve the interest of corporations, but also criminalize the foundation of Africa's agriculture, the free saving, exchanging, selling, and the breeding of farmer seed by smallholder farmers. Currently, regional harmonization processes are now moving to the continental level by way of the AU's continental guidelines for the harmonization of seed frameworks. And we will witness more expeditious corporate takeover of seed, food, and agricultural systems in the continent. Now, African civil society organizations have pushed back against this draconian seed legislation in the African continent. We have raised numerous concerns and objections and have, have, have urged African governments to recognize farmer seed systems as crucial for a just, equitable, sustainable, and ecological farming system in Africa. We have a proven track record on critiquing and opposing regional harmonization processes, pushing for the restrictive and unsuitable UPOP 91 model in SADAC and the REPO, which is the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, and also at national levels. Now, these struggles have been successful in preventing SADAC and the REPO from joining UPOP, and we have successfully pushed for exemptions for smallholder farmers in the use of protected variety. Now, under the AU, we have challenged the undemocratic policy processes and the exclusion of African civil society organizations and farmers in this process and pushed for the recognition of farmer managed systems and farmers' rights based on the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture and also the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas. At the moment, farmer managed seed systems in integrated, has been integrated throughout the draft guidelines of the AU um, and considered primarily for mainstreaming. However, this is dangerously being viewed primarily through its commodity value and with com commercial opportunities rather than needing to be considered separately to the formal seed sector with its own specific need for support and strengthening. Now we have further cautioned against um, a number of things under the uh, AU seed harmonization guidelines, and these include the registration of farmers' varieties into a commercial system that is designed to serve corporate interests, and this threatens to facilitate the expropriation of local crops and indigenous knowledge with little or no foreseeable benefit to local farmers. We've also cautioned against promoting new pop as a means for harmonizing plant variety protection on the continent and disagree with the bifurcating farmers' rights and UPOV as mutually supportive. South Africa quite far advanced uh, with a highly industrialized commercial seed, seed and agriculture system, most recently developed draft regulations which offer some degree of regulatory space for the continued existence of farmer seed systems and the right to reuse, exchange and sell seed also set out under Article 9.3 of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Agriculture and Article 19.1 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas. However, this is not fully exhaustive as there are still many elements missing for the full realization of farmers' rights and the right to seed. The orientation of seed laws in South Africa is still geared towards commercial seed interests 
and provide only exemptions, exceptions for small scale farmers. However, the fundamental need to support farmer managed systems ensures the rights and needs of farmers are, um, are adequately addressed and the safeguarding of genetic and agricultural biodiversity are lacking. That said, the regulatory space provided creates the basis for further work to be done in supporting and developing farmer seed systems and its integration with appropriate food and agriculture systems based on the principles of agroecology. Now, what is the way forward for Africa towards a just transition to sustainable and agroecological food and agricultural systems? We must be clear that uh, the seed and plant variety protection laws are commercial laws and they do not contain measures to safeguard the diversity on farm and the continued maintenance of heterogeneous seed in farmer managed systems, which is vital to ensure food security and resilient food systems. The exemptions in seed laws and plant variety protection laws do not implement farmers' rights and do very little to promote farmer managed seed systems. What is needed is complete autonomy of a seed, which is a prerequisite and core component of the exercise of rights by family and community farmers and peasants. Therefore, protections are needed against patterns, plant variety protection laws, uh, and, and, and the like, which erode the exercise of farmers' rights. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food Michael Fakri, in his report released um, earlier this year, emphasizes the importance of farmer managed seed systems as integral to the world's genetic and cultural diversity, being fundamental for all food systems. Thus, as mankind relies on plants for food, feed, fiber, and a functional ecosystem, nothing less than the right to life is at stake when farmer seed systems are challenged or poorly supported. And thus farmers' rights, which are equated to human rights, must be fully enshrined in law in a positive and independent way and not locked into very small niches of exemptions to other rights, of negative exemptions to other rights. And we, do, we need to have further discussions about the articulation of these rights with farmers and grassroots on the ground in order to fully conceptualize what this means in the specific local context. African governments must expressly recognize farmers' seed and farmers' right to seed and seed practices as necessary building blocks for our struggle for transformation towards seed and food sovereignty. We must work towards protecting and expanding territorial markets, towards ensuring local and community markets for seed, crops, and produce, including also inter alia public procurement programs built around diverse crops for food and nutrition security programs. Thank you. Régler les problèmes climatiques, il faut que nous adoptons le mode de production qui ne va pas exposer le sol, qui ne va pas détruire l'environnement. Avec les produits chimiques, on tue les petits petits bêtes qui donnent la force à la terre. Les bicides rendaient le sol très très, très dur. Tu travailles dessus, ça ne ça, ça donne plus. Si on doit gagner le pari du stockage de carbone, ça doit forcément transiter par l'agriculture biologique comme ce que nous faisons au sein de la Société coopérative équitable du Bandama. Quand 
avant, on était en conventionnel. Quand on traitait, les sentaient sont, sont malades. Toi-même, la nuit, tu sens que vraiment ta respiration n'est pas ça. D'autres sont tombés malades, d'autres en sont morts. C'est maintenant Biola est venu. C'est un peu difficile à faire, mais lorsque les producteurs finissent de faire cette activité, ils sont satisfaits. La première année, j'ai chuté, puis avec les entretiens, la production a changé. Le formateur me forme, moi aussi, je forme quelqu'un d'autre. Au lieu d'aller ailleurs, <rire> je suis là, je vis paisiblement avec ma petite famille. C'est encore intéressant. Ici, par exemple, nous avons des glucidia pour fixer de, de l'azote dans le sol. Quand tu vois que c'est joli, ça te donne la force pour travailler. C'est un fourmi rouge là, qui fait qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de bêtes. Avec les poulets aussi, ça les chasse. Nous produisons nous-mêmes nos intrants. À partir de tout ce qui est déchet, tout ce qui est herbe, qu'on qu pense que c'est des herbes qui sont encombrantes. Nous les valorisons à travers notre biofabrique pour fabriquer des, des intrants. Alors, ici, nous avons une matrice de micro-organismes solides. Nous allons partir dans le sous-bois pour récupérer des micro-organismes, donc la litière de forêt, ou des arbres qui ont de l'expérience dans la vie. On va utiliser une source de sucre naturel, une source d'amidon, c'est-à-dire le remoulage du riz, et puis laisser fermenter pendant un mois. Et comme ça, tous ces bidons qui sont là, ce sont des biofertilisants spécifiques. Ils sont encore moins chers par rapport aux produits chimiques. Les dépenses sont moins et puis la production aussi est bonne. Ici, nous avons autour de 800 kg à l'hectare. Dans le conventionnel, il devait être autour de 600 kg à l'hectare. Alors, le producteur qui est avec nous, il a non seulement de l'argent, il ne manipule pas des produits chimiques pour tomber malade et puis dépenser cet argent-là à l'hôpital. Il a une très bonne santé, il est bien nourri. C'est vraiment l'agriculture durable que nous pratiquons ici au niveau de la chaîne. Welcome to Chimani Mani, the land of bananas, mountains and views. Today I'm here to learn more about traditional indigenous vegetables that grow randomly in our gardens and yards, those that we do not see or notice. Join me as I talk to my Furise about this valuable knowledge and cultural roots. Mike, I'm going to go to the Je <laughs> Ah, il y a un Ah, il y a un peu de temps. Il y a un peu de temps. Il y a un peu de temps. Ah, tu vois, Mirai, Miripiri, non, on se chante. Miripiri, on ne pense pas que tu as un petit machin, tu as un Murio. Eh, eh, oh, boss, on a un sang, on a un gars. Murio, j'ai un gars. Eh, eh. Gagan, David, moi. 
Gaka is Ninge Boris. No water, my Shaka is soft as room berries. Room berries. A hey, what a man, a mirpidia. Eh, what for Sanga Sagu was on Bigan Sripa Machete? Nays is Shima Ningish, my Boris. My Boris is in Gaka. Eh, Sana Sengaka is. Okay. Eh, hey, I come. My young leaves. Eh, hey, I come sorry. I come sorry, sorry. Eh, hey, Tata, na to enda. Don't know again. Zagwa ku kuno tswa muduri. Kutswa. Eh, kutswa. Kasa tswa jiji ne diga manje. Aivi. 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 Tika sa tswa saka tofa no titi tu. Alright. Eh, hey, tika tswa ano iva. Tishida ku so gadira shi chiri mo tino pan sa kuwa omesa. Tatu kwa daro to ya nika oma. Oma. To so tswa hengwa ekunenge ku Farinha I don't tomatoes, <laughs> you are going to go to tomato. Become do you to right. black jagger. So Matete food. Eh, ngatikai. Saka pa muriyo e chini yagare matete ndano anzo nungwa kuti anajige fresh. Eh, okay. Nikuti tishibi kwa ori fresh itano to nunga matete. Alright. Uyu mwakanga uyu kuma kuma unge shogu wakomba. Eh, wakomba. Tinenge to itra mufushwa. Uyu mufushwa. Eh, ah okay. Saka black jack chichi ngoja ino ndakanzo dino rap. Eh, ino rap a BP. Okay. Vura kutanga yai mwenye mwa boeri sa ya mo visa. Eh. Do you not see Thanks so much for watching. To see the next clip, please go to facebook.com slash regeneration international slash